Creativity isn't simply mimicking what has worked for others. It's the opposite, actually. You need to live an interesting life if you want to create interesting things. Let's have ourselves a pocket-sized pep talk because I've got a guest here who believes with the right awareness and attitude, anyone can sharpen their creativity, inspire change in their field and the world. A pocket-sized pep talk, the podcast that can help energize your business and your life with a quick, inspiring message. Now, here's your host, Rob Jollis. Today's guest, Aaron Goldfarb, is one of the co-authors of Brand Mysticism, Cultivate Creativity and Intoxicate Your Audience. That was actually recently published in November 22. Aaron is a novelist, author, and journalist who frequently writes about the spirits industry and drinking culture for the New York Times, Esquire, Punch, and Vine Pair. Nice to meet you, and welcome to the show, Aaron. Thanks for having me. You bet. Well, it is a pleasure to have you, and let's dive right in. And I, with you, I want to I want to go back to 2018. I, cue the cue the cue the music. Uh, and you're you're. I'm guessing uh, you read. How do you make a booze brand go viral? And fittingly, it, it went viral and it was shared hundreds of thousands of times. So my notes say, and you meet your writing partner Steve Grass. I smell a story. So so walk me through that. How did how did we get here? Well, you know, as a drinks journalist, I'm just constantly looking for stories and interesting people to interview and write about. And, you know, I produce dozens, if not more than 100 features a year. So I'd heard about this guy, Steve Grass. I'd never met him. And, you know, I knew he had had created Hendrix Gin and Sailor Jerry Rum and some other stuff. But around 2018, he was really creating some strange things. He most notably that year came out with something called Eau de Musk. It was a whiskey flavored with what he called beaver anus. But it was really this thing called castorum, which is a historical flavor agent. And, and it is indeed made with uh, beaver. So that product had kind of gone viral and been written about all across the world, um, in addition to all his other things. So I was like, who is this guy that everything he creates, you know, goes viral? You don't think about alcohol brands as necessarily going viral. So I wanted to know what his magic touch was. And, uh, you know, I interviewed him for two to three hours that, that first time, which is very long for me. I can usually get what I need in a half hour to an hour. Um, but we were having just such a, a raucous time talking on the phone and I almost didn't want it to end and you know I had no need to write a story almost I was enjoying it so much so uh, I wrote that story and it, it did indeed do well um and then we didn't talk for for two years until his agent Claire who I know right before the pandemic in February of 2020 asked if I would take the train down to Philadelphia and, and meet with Steve and when I got to his offices he said uh you know I, I want to write a, a book and I'd like uh, you to be the one who, who writes it with me. Oh, okay. All right. And so, and, and so the, the pairing begins. Uh, yes. Now, uh, I got a business audience and I was intrigued by you because of, uh, you know, because of, of the branding message. So um, I'm assuming I don't have to be a, a drinker to benefit from this book on branding, right? Right. Yes. You know, that's, you know, I, I think to a certain extent, some of the people tasked with selling this book haven't necessarily relayed that message that, you know, this, this is a book, it's not stocked in the booze section, it's stocked in the business and marketing section of, of, of bookstores. Um, you know, this, this, for people that are just interested in cocktail recipes or, or learning about spirits, you know, you'll learn about spirits in this book for sure. But, you know, this is more for, you know, would-be entrepreneurs, creative thinkers, people that want to start brands, you know, whether you want to start a, a, a tiny little t-shirt brand or, or conquer the world with your, you know, cupcake dynasty or whatnot, you know, I think this book would have, have messages that would benefit you and teach you how, how your brand can stand out from everyone else in the marketplace. Good. All right. Good answer. Now... <laughs> <laughs> the right answer now let, let, let's just go a little bit deeper for you and and steve how easy or difficult was it 
to cross over with these concepts? You know, the book doesn't necessarily relay Steve's messages and then say, and here's also people in these fields that are doing this. It's his message, and you're going to have to do a little work yourself to to go realize how it would relate to your own business. But, you know, the great thing about, you know, booze is, is it, it, it is a product that you can relate to lots of other things. Um, you know, it, it, it's sold in, in various places. It's, you know... It's uh, shelf stable for the most part. So, you know, you're not going to have to worry about how quickly to sell it. You know, Steve talks about how, you know, a previous job, he, he, he did the marketing and branding for Puma. And that was something that was very stressful to him because fashion, you have to sell within weeks or not months or it's out of style. You know, alcohol doesn't go out of style per se. You know, certain things go out of style, but, you know, a lot of these brands have been around forever. Hendrix Gin has been around since 1999 when Steve created it, and it's it's doing as good as ever. It's it's seemingly never going to go out of style unless you know drinking gin or drinking alcohol goes out of style. So it, it's a real product that you know is great for marketers to work with and, and and see how they can sell it. So I think that will translate to a lot of people, no matter what field they're in. Yeah. You know, I was actually thinking when I went to, to school, I'm a University of Maryland guy. Uh, Rolling Rock, as an example of beer, was um, not necessarily that. And I, mean, I, I love the beer and I, I drink a Rolling Rock. So we're not attacking Rolling Rock, but it wasn't really considered the greatest beer in the world. Now, I'm, sure. I'm back in the late 70s, early 80s, if you don't mind. Uh, but Rolling Rock kind of did a rebranding of sorts. And I am I noticed, you know, decades later, it, it being a sort of a classier beer with a just a shinier bottle, a couple of things. But, uh, you know, do they change the recipe is it, or is it all branding? How, how does a company like that do a 180? Well, you know, I mean, you know, a lot of people think a Rolling Rock is what they were drinking in the Deer Hunter. <laughs> These, uh, you know, yeah. blue collar guys from uh, the Pennsylvania area. You're absolutely right. And the book talks about, Steve doing rebrandings, what he calls self-esteem for big brands for a lot of these classic beer brands. And you're right. They don't change what's in the bottle because um, a lot of people d don't even know what's going on behind the scenes. You know, do a lot of people know Budweiser's owned by a Belgian Brazilian company? Probably not. They think it's just a great American beer brand. Yeah. Um, you know, Steve thinks these classic brands, and the longer you've been around, the more you have to work with, uh, you need to lean more into what made them great in the first place. You know, he talks about Miller High Life, which was not doing particularly well when he started working with them. It was kind of seen as like a jokey hipster beer you got for very cheap in, uh, you know, dive bars. And he wanted to rebrand it as the Champagne of Beers, which they had called themselves since the, the get-go. They were one of the first beers to bottle themselves. They were in a clear bottle, which was seen as very classy at the time because you, you could actually see the contents and see, see that nothing, nothing funny was going on. And they're also, you know, a, 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 um, you know, a very carbonated beer, which was unusual for the time. So he wanted to lean into all these things when he rebranded Miller High Life and say, yeah, you know, this kind of is the champagne of beers. You know, no one's going to be fooled into thinking it's it's an expensive, you know, luxury item. But you can lean into why people love this thing in the first place. And you've seen a great uh, renaissance with Miller High Life over the last few years since uh, Steve dealt with it. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, it's interesting. You also just mentioning a clear bottle. That's another thing that's done that it seems to to go every 10 years, it's sort of like a windshield wiper. It goes back and forth. Cause I remember when a clear bottle was not really considered a very good, you know, whatever it was, it was like too simple. Then all of a sudden it became incredibly classy to have, to have that clear bottle of, you know, a Corona I believe has a clear bottle. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a couple of them, but I look at them now and I remember, Hey, I remember you. I, I used to think that meant you weren't a good beer. Now you are a good beer. Uh, yeah, trends change. I mean, well, you, you talk about Rolling Rock, which is famously yeah. in the green bottle. Yeah. You know, another one of Steve's big branding clients was Pilsner Urkel, which when he took it over was also in a green bottle. 
And its biggest issue when it came to America was it skunked. If you don't know a lot about beer, uh, UV light can get through green bottles and mm. literally skunk the hops and cause a skunky taste. So a lot of Americans didn't really like Pilsner or Kell because by the time it got to America, it was skunked and it smelled bad and tasted bad. And they said, well, why is it in this green bottle that doesn't protect from that? And they said, because because you know that's a trendy thing to do and what we've always done um you know the the rebranding from that was literally saying we, we don't have to have it in a green bottle you know let's can it let's put it in dark glass and people will be able to taste that you know this is the original pilsner and the world's great pilsner so sometimes a branding is is as simple as that yeah i uh, you know all right we'll leave the word the world of beer obviously <laughs> bob jollis likes a beer now and then i, I guess that just came <laughs> out uh but but um, I think the bigger picture is, and, and, and I'm learning from you, so you tell me, uh, is, you know, the knee jerk reaction for most people in branding, and I run a business is, gee, let's be everything for everybody. And then, of course, yeah. we learn that the quickest way to kill a company is to be everything for everybody. So uh, how does a company figure out, you know, I, I can sell it if you tell me what you want that customer to want. How do we figure out when we, you know, we've got different businesses listening right now um, and maybe they want to, uh, you know, kind of take another look at their branding. How do you figure out, you know, what your brand is when, when you're in, sometimes we call it a sea of sameness, you know, we're all kind of producing the same thing. I work in so many companies that, you know, staffing industries, the car, car automotive, they're all selling cars, they're all staffing. And yet, they're trying to figure out what makes them unique. Is there, is there a trick to that? Or, or how do you figure out, you know, what your unique branding is? Well, you know, I think you make a, a good point, first of all, with, with trying to sell everything to everything. You know, the world is getting more, you know, fractured. And, you know, there's, what, 7, 8 billion people in the world, 350 million Americans. You know, the days of, of you know, selling a hundred million of anything to anyone is, is over, you know, if you can, can get just, you know, less than 1% of that audience, you're still selling millions and millions of things. And that's quite, quite good these days. So Steve has always, always felt that you should be, you know, the most direct and maybe even the most niche, you know, uh, Sailor Jerry, his, his rum, he launched in 1999 in the same week that Hendrix Gin was created. Amazingly enough, that was for, you know, post World War II tattooed, you know, kind of punks. Yeah. Um, which which seems like, well, that's a very silly, very tiny audience to sell to, but no one had ever really sold to such a small audience like that. And it wasn't a small audience. You know, there were millions of those people apparently in America. And it's now the number two spice spice rum brand. In America, I mean, you look at Captain Morgan's. Who who are they selling for? That's the number one spice rum brand. You know, they they probably for just mere fact that they've existed longer are number one. You know, they are trying to sell by now to everybody, and I, I don't know if that's going to fail them eventually. And, and Sailor Jerry might take over, but you know, same with Hendrix Gin. H Hendrix Gin, Steve created to to sell to people that you know he called them unusualists, people that liked unusual things this was a the first gin that was kind of low juniper juniper is the key botanical key flavoring in, in gin that a lot of people you know find offensive quite frankly um and why they don't drink gin you know it was lower gin or lower juniper levels it had cucumber in it which was very strange and then you know going back to bottling most all gins were in classic british looking clear bottles and this was in dark glass, small and circular, like an apothecary bottle. You know, this this was for people in 1999 that kind of wanted a statement about what they drank about. You know, these were people that were on the cutting edge of, you know, artisanal liquors, which didn't exist in 1999. It's hard to remember they didn't exist. Now there's thousands of artisanal gins that have kind of become the same. So, you know, Steve's always felt that that the more more niche, the more obscure you get, the the easier you'll find an audience, believe it or not. Yo, it makes complete sense because, uh, you know, a lot of times everyone's fighting over, you know, this massive part of the audience. Remember in, in there was a, a show I saw once where 
company was trying to survive in high end dog food. And, uh, but they were battling it out with all the other high end dog foods. And the consultant that was working with them said, well, what about a lower end? They went, oh, that'll change your brand. What if we can find a, the best low end, high end in a sense, who's going after them? And, you know, it might be 15% of the market, but it's all yours if we can find it. And uh, it was really interesting that the process they went through. And as you're speaking, and I'll move off this, but I was thinking how branding worked on me as a kid. Two sodas that I really liked. And, and you'll know why the moment I tell you what they were. And, and again, I'm, I'm a little older than you, but so I'm going back into the 70s. I was a Dr. Pepper guy and I was a 7-Up guy. Do, do you know me now? I wanted to be the Uncola. I wanted to be somebody different. You know, I wanted to be a damn pepper. Uh, and um, and I loved it. Did I li actually like the taste of Dr. Pepper? Not particularly. Uh, 7-Up was okay. Uh, but uh, I liked the branding and the branding brought me, brought me to them. And so, you know, what you're saying to me is, is really important. And I hope people are listening that, you know, step one, I think is just to figure out, like I said, we got to figure out what that branding, you know, who you're trying to attract. But if I've got you right, tell me if I'm wrong. We don't have to be obsessed on grabbing the biggest market share piece we can grab a smaller piece. We just have to own it. We just have to, we have to get there first and dominate it. And that small piece will do just fine. Got it. Am I there? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I, I mean, I think it's, it's when you probably don't worry about trying to grab the biggest thing that you accidentally to do. I mean, <laughs> I think, I think the guys who created, you know, hard seltzer, you know, five to seven years ago, hmm. I, I can't imagine they thought, wow, this is going to be, you know, the biggest, biggest, you know, thing in alcohol right now, you know, flavored alcoholic seltzer water. And, and indeed it has become, you know, lot, lots of things work out like that when you're, you're just focused on, on selling to, to, you know, the first people to really, that would really enjoy it. Then you have your, your acolytes and, and it moves into the world at large. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Uh, all right. You've got eight life lessons with, with my <laughs> research is showing me, you know, I'm, I'm scratching my head going eight life lessons. How did, how did eight life lessons fall out of this? But, um, that, but, but that will, uh, impact or spark your creativity and your creative energy. Um, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to give you a, a podcast challenge. Uh -oh. uh, and I'll give you, you can take one of the, you can take door number one or door number two. I, I, I my audience isn't going to sit for 25 minutes while we go through eight life lessons. Okay. What they will sit for is if a guy is nimble and hit him in about 30 okay. seconds a pop, or that's if you go, Rob, that's not how life lessons work. I'll say, okay, cherry pick two of them, two of them for me, but uh, walk me through these life lessons and I'm giving you the lead on this one. Okay. I, I'm going to go the long route. Talk a little bit more than the 30 second route. All right. Well, if you go the long route, you only get a couple of them then. So pick your, pick we'll a couple good ones. Okay, good. Okay, so so the four magical ingredients of booze, you know. Okay. Here's what, you know, Steve feels you need to create a booze brand, you know. There's over a thousand distilleries in America right now. You know, it's it's absolutely shocking how many bourbon brands are entering the market. You know, there's over 10,000 breweries in America right now. So what would drive an insane person to abs to open a, a brewery or distillery? Um but Steve still thinks you can succeed if you have these four magical ingredients. Great packaging, of course. That's simple. Um, a complex brand world, which he thinks is one of the most important. So he makes fun of a lot of brands that just have great packaging, but mm -hmm. there's nothing behind it. Kind of a Potemkin right. brand. You know, Give me an something... example. Well, he calls them Brooklyn brands, which is, you know, an insult to where I live, but he's sort of right. You know, everyone's seen the $25 jar of pickles, beautiful, you know, graphics and whatnot. You know, what what's the point? Why is it called that? You know, what it, you know, with Hendrix, for example, you know, the, the bottle was based on, you know, the apothecary bottles from from old time London. Um the story around it was was based on Jules Verne. The, the the stills to make gin reminded Steve very much of of Jules Verne's magical, you know, uh, 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 motors and, and whatnot. So he he wanted to weave a, a Jules Verne storyline in. Um, 
to it. Uh, the 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 commercials, the the Hendrix commercials have always been made of of cut paper and whatnot, kind of like Monty Python. Mm -hmm. uh, they didn't have the budget to do acting or whatnot, so they did that. So he's weaving in this whole brand thing he calls the onion method. Now, of course, you can enjoy Hendrix Gen if you don't know any of this stuff. Right. But if you've been a if you're a passionate fan, you're gonna want to go on the website and read about it. You know, you're gonna want to learn more about it. You know, Hendrix Gen was doing so well amongst its its first uh, fans in the the early aughts that they were literally able to release their own hardbound book for super fans um, to collect. You know, what what brands can do that if you think really hard yeah. about it. Yeah. So the complex brand world, Steve thinks, is absolutely uh, critical. And then uh, differentiated liquid um, is probably probably the most critical, maybe even more critical than brand work. Doesn't necessarily mean good liquid. You know, no, no critics are going to say Sailor Jerry is a world-class rum, but it's differentiated liquid. It's high proof spiced rum. Captain Morgan is lower proof spiced rum. That's not the most incredible differentiation ever, but you know, it is something. Steve's, Steve's stuff that he's currently making for Tamworth Distilling, his craft distillery in New Hampshire, that's obscenely differentiated liquid that's you know as i mentioned beaver anus flavored whiskey you know right. you think you can get some press out of that of course you can uh, right. but you have to be able to deliver with a complex brand world great packaging and and all the other things to do it and when you're creating a, a beaver anus whiskey you're not expecting it to become the next jeff daniels you're going to know that's only going to sell a certain amount of, of right. product okay all right um I, and i'm pulling from what you just said <laughs> Um, you got to be unique and you got to figure out, figure out what differentiates you. Because remember, I'm going to keep moving you from the booze world into the business world, the rest of us. And um, yeah. as a guy who runs a business, um, there's more than one sales trainer out there. Uh, but I've got to figure out what differentiates me, uh, what makes me unique. And, and I keep telling you, for me as a sales person who specializes in sales, I can't sell it until I know what I want you to want. Uh, and so by answering those questions and going through those doors and figuring out, which isn't easy all the time, what, what makes us different, what makes us unique, and then, you know, build our model, build our product to it. Uh, I, I think we can get that condensed part of the population, own it and sell to it. And, uh, it all makes sense. All right. I'm, I'm, I've got one last question for you. All right. Okay. That's Steve, 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 Steve. I don't want to talk <laughs> about Steve. I, I know, want to talk about like, Aaron, okay? Yeah. So yeah. I want to hear Aaron tell me, and don't use the word Steve. I want to I hear Aaron. To. <laughs> I want to hear Aaron tell me about uh, any particular mentors that you've had, other than Steve, okay? <laughs> that um, have helped to make you a good writer, make you a good journalist. Tell me something about Aaron. Well, you know, even as I was giving this podcast, I could hear how crazy I sounded continually mentioning Steve. I, you know, I sound like, uh, you know, Waylon Smithers or something. <laughs> Just, <laughs> um, no, you know, I, I've had, you know, a lot of great mentors. I, I unfortunately don't have like, you know, the one powerful force that that put me under his or her wing and, and guided me. But, you know, I, I entered journalism um, probably 10 years into my career as I was a novelist and you know, a bit of a failed screenwriter. And I realized maybe journalism would be um, a better way to actually sell writing. Um, so, you know, a lot of people that first helped me and ushered me into the journalism world were very key. You know, I think of, you know, someone like uh, this woman, uh, Tali Bioki, who was uh, my editor at this, this drinks pub publication called Punch, which is a good publication. Um, really kind of taught me how to turn in good work, edit it, and, and the kind of work that people would enjoy and that could, you know, potentially go viral and, and be read by people. So, you know, she was very important to me. Um, you know, Esquire was one of the first places I actually uh, did journalism for, and there was a whole slew of, of people there that um, that mentored me. You know, I've never had a a, uh, a desk job at a publication. I've never had a staff job. I've always been a freelancer sitting at home at, at this. Oh, desk I'm shocked. Another... I'm shocked by that. When I, when, when you first came on the air, I was like, well, where are we? Well, what am I looking at here? 
Yeah. I, you don't yeah. seem like a desk job guy to me. Yeah. I don't have enough. I don't have enough pairs of socks to, to get a desk <laughs> job. Um, but yeah, just, you know, all these little mentors throughout mostly New York who've, who've helped me, um, helped me learn how to be a journalist and, and eventually an author and, and work my way through a career as a, as a working writer for sure. And Steve, of course. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Look, the book is called Brand Mysticism, Cultivate Creativity and Intoxicate Your Audience. It's uh, published by The Running Press, just came out November 8th. I'm assuming we could, we'll find it on Amazon with the other millions and millions of books, but we know what to look for here. Uh, and um, how do people get a hold of you and Steve? I, <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm easier to get a hold of than him. Oh, good. Uh, you know? I'm on every single social media platform until Elon Musk kicks me off some of them. Uh, Aaron Goldfarb, one word combined. Um, you can email me too. It's pretty easy to figure out how to email me. Uh, and I answer just about everything that people send me unless it's just blatantly rude and offensive, but I might even answer that as well. Okay. Um, uh, now, <laughs> I'm laughing at the email address you put out there. My email address is it's easy to find find it. What what's your email? Is it Aaron Goldfarb at gmail.com? What, what what's what's the email address? It, it is, you know, I, I have such an easy email address that if people can't figure it out with like nine seconds of work, I'm not sure I want to hear from them. So Okay. But you fig you figured it out. So all right. I I cracked the code. All right, sounds good. Hey, listen, um, I enjoyed getting to know you today Aaron Goldfarb uh, <laughs> and uh, I appreciate your time and um, you taught us plenty and uh, you're making me thirsty all of that in me one too. podcast good job anyway really appreciate the time you gave us and um, uh, good luck to you and your co-author and uh, appreciate you being on the show thanks so much it was fun okay well we'll do it again as well as we can next time until then stay safe Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, please rate and recommend it on iTunes, Outcast, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can also get more information on this show and Rob at Jollis.com. <laughs>